I'm uh, Patricia Harvey, I'm a professor of biochemistry and I'm also head of the Aquatic Biotechnology and Biology Lab of the University of Greenwich. And we're standing in the pilot laboratory which has been funded by a European project to cultivate microalgae. And all across Europe we've got laboratories just like this where scientists are busy cultivating microalgae to be able to test them into new foods. And here at the university, we're focusing our efforts um, on a tiny little orange-yellow microalga called Daneliella salina. The clue is in the salina. Salina means salt. And these are salt-loving algae, which means that they grow in salty water, which we can't drink, around the globe, and also consume carbon dioxide. So they become incredibly sustainable. The really good thing about these algae is not only do they grow in salty water that we can't drink and consume carbon dioxide, but that they also produce protein, which we can digest. They also produce glycerol, which is the basis of a new biofuel that we're working on with a company called uh, Aquafuel. And they also produce carotenoids, very high concentrations of carotenoids, probably the most concentrated in the world. One of the really interesting things about these carotenoids is that this alga produces a very unique one called 9-sus-beta-carotene. And 9-sus-beta-carotene has been shown to be very, very important for treating eye diseases and atherosclerosis. And when we cultivate these algae under red light, what we've discovered is that they produce a huge boost on this 9-sus-beta-carotene. Now, the other really interesting thing about these algae is that they taste pretty good as well. They taste with a floral flavor and uh, not, too, not too bitter, which means that they're ideal for incorporating into cakes and into chocolates. And I have a postdoc team of people who are busy incorporating and testing the uh, value of making new ingredients out of Daneliella salina to incorporate into chocolates and cakes. Our goal, as that of all of the European partners that we have, is to push forward microalgae to become a new superfood, a new um, health, healthy ingredient into new food products to not only be able to provide more protein to feed people, but also to serve as a sustainable, healthy ingredient to maintain the health of our populations. These microalgae grow at the bottom of the trophic food level. For so long now, we've been eating fish, which are equivalent to the lions of the trophic food chain, at the very top and it's time that we started to become vegetarians and eat at the lower trophic levels. And these are the bottom of the trophic level, which are consumed ultimately by fish going through the value chain. So these algae are incredibly important. And what we're really wanting to do is to encourage people to start eating at the bottom of the trophic level. So that means that we will become much more sustainable in terms of our diets. But uh, in addition, this particular alga is great because it consumes carbon dioxide. We grow it in sunlight. If we boost it with low energy red light, we get very high levels of these valuable carotenoids. But they also grow in salt water, which means that we don't have to use arable land. We grow them in containers like this or in um, plastic lined big raceways outdoors. And under those conditions, you can set these up under brownfield sites. You can also set them up in the middle of the desert. As long as you've got a supply of carbon dioxide, which of course is what we're wanting to reduce, a supply of carbon dioxide and salty water, off you go. Daneliella salina is uh, an interesting alga because it's got grass status, which means that it's generally regarded as safe grass. It's generally regarded as safe in the US. It's also been eaten as a traditional food for a very long time in the Far East. But in Europe, it's not yet recognized as having been eaten before 1997. And that means that it's got to get through what's known as the Novel Food Act. So what we're trying to do is to really push the agenda to be able to show the value of incorporating the alga into tasty foods and food ingredients and to show that they are generally regarded as safe. We're very, very excited at the moment because there is generally a push to recognize that there have been a number of algae that have been eaten for quite some time um, in, across the globe and that ought to be re-examined and looked at for having novel food status. If that's the case, 
the agenda will be massive to be able to rapidly grow as much as we possibly can of this alga. So our next tasks, next targets, is to work out with teams of people across Europe as to how we can massively increase the cultivation of this alga in order to be able to satisfy the demand that we're pushing at the other side for people to be able to recognize and eat these as important ingredients in food. Around Europe, we've also got armies of postdoctoral research fellows, such as Dr. Zhu here. And what Dr. Zhu is doing is incorporating the microalga into cake products and tasty new foods in order to be able to test them. Nancy, I do if you want to say something. Yeah, so we have been trying to incorporate the powder of Danalila into uh, food metrics, such as uh, cakes and also some smoothies, drinks. So uh, what we are testing is um, the uh, volatile compound uh, contributing to the unique flavor of the Danalila Salina powder. And also we can say the uh, carotenoids in Danalila Salina uh, provide a very delightful color to the food and also they would uh, provide health benefits to human bodies. So we start by cultivating these algae in little flasks and then from the flasks we inoculate them into long columns of tubes and then from there we move them into tubular photobioreactors like this where we're able to get a, a much bigger volume but we also cultivate them in these open pond raceways and these open pond raceways can be as big as you want them to be outdoors. Here, we're just optimizing the construction and the flow in order to be able to keep the water flowing with the algae, providing them with sufficient exposure to light and carbon dioxide, and um, building up their biomass. But as I say, we move from small ones to bigger ones, and then outdoors to huge scale, hundreds and thousands of hectares and more.